the apocalypse. Today, we're going to learn why Americans seem to be so obsessed with the end of the world. And to talk about it, we're going to use the number one non-apocalypse of my lifetime, Y2K, and also how this all plays into the development of the American far right. Hello, I'm Tristan Johnson, an actual historian. Um, I have like a degree in every, you know what? See? Hi, I'm Tristan Johnson. I've got this that says I know things. I read way too many things about history. And for the last few years, I've been doing this series on the development of the American far right. Basically, I'm trying to understand how we got from disaffected Vietnam veterans in the 1970s who turned to groups like the Klan or neo-Nazi groups and how that has a through line all the way till... On the West Front, the mob tore down scaffolding, battled their way through the last line of police defense, and broke into the Capitol building itself. An attempted coup that happened on January 6, 2021. Or, you know, whatever other horrible atrocities are in our future. The reason I'm talking about this is because I think I'm not the only one to point out that American democracy is rather fragile and getting more fragile by the day. And because of the nature of geopolitics, America's business tends to become everyone else's given enough time. You know, the Americans elected Donald Trump, and in a few years, Canadians are having to deal with wackos like Maxim Bernier. And the other reason I'm doing this is because I get to talk about Y2K, which is fun. It's one of those really big social hysterical events that after it happened, just kind of went under the radar. And if you're not old enough to remember Y2K, it seems extremely strange in retrospect. But just so that I can feel really, really old, how about in the comments we sound off about how many of you remember Y2K or were even alive for it? I don't know why I'm doing this, this is terrible. Today, we are looking at the 15 oldest objects ever found. Just, you know, go into the comments and call me a boomer or something. This thing's actually kind of heavy. First things first, I'm going to need to come clean about some of the ways that I did this series in the past and things that I'm going to have to come to terms with and expand if I'm really going to understand the American far right. See, this series up until the Oklahoma City video was primarily inspired by Bringing the War Home, which is a documentation of the white power movement by Kathleen Ballou, which is really, really good and I really recommend reading. But in doing so, I was building this narrative that was leading from these neo-Nazis and Klansmen in the 1970s and the 1980s with a direct through line through the militia movement all the way till today, uh, sort of implying that the militia movement is just a uh, disguised or sanitized version of those white power movements. And while there is some ways this is useful, it immediately ran to problems because painting the militia movement with such a broad brush uh, is a grotesque oversimplification. And so the second I started talking to real, actual experts on the militia movement, I was immediately informed that uh, these groups are a lot more complicated and have drives and ideas that have a lot more diversity than just closeted Nazis. Not saying that they're like, you know, uh, all of a sudden redeemable or great people or founded on good ideas, just that the situation's a lot more noodly and there's a few things that I think I need to clarify before I move forward in order to understand what this militia movement was beyond just re-sanitized far-right talking points. Although there is an element to that, don't, don't, don't get lost here. But what's important to know is that militias in the 1990s grew out of various conservative to far-right concerns and conspiracy theories. And yes, many militia members did and do believe in the New World Order conspiracy theory, which is just lightly sanitized uh, version of Zog, Zionist occupational government, which is a anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. So the New World Order is essentially anti-Semitism without saying anti-Semitism. You know, it's just anti-Semitism with a thin veneer of plausible deniability. But here's the thing that tends to be true of almost every conspiracy theory, actually. The entire concept of a secret group of evildoers who are conspiring behind the scenes to orchestrate world events in order to satisfy some evil agenda, that entire concept has its roots in anti-Semitism. It's also true that through common social gatherings, things like gun shows and survival events, as well as cross-pollination through literature, through books like the Turner Diaries, for example, there is a lot of exchange of ideas and just a lot of 
interconnectivity between the far right neo-Nazi, like, you know, actual, like not uh, people who deny it, people who are actually members of groups like Aryan resistance or groups like the actual Ku Klux Klan and the people who are members in these militia movements. But it's a lot more complicated than that because it always is, that's the nature of doing history. I don't know if you know this, but history is hard because humans refuse to follow any rules. So yes, some militia groups and many members within various militia groups did have this far right genealogy. But then you've also got a lot, and I mean a lot of militia groups that grew out of just raising uh, right wing concerns that grew in the 1990s, especially that were sort of ginned up by things like conservative talk radio and the advent of Fox News and all that kind of stuff as you're getting further into the 21st century. And while they might have been inspired by other militia groups that have their roots in far right ideology, these people might just be your typical conservative, which uh, means that, you know, in the 1990s, they might not have actually had that kind of like explicit racist uh, genealogy. Today, uh, being a mainstream conservative basically means to adopt a lot of far-right white nationalist ideology. But that was a project that took decades of targeted work to sort of sanitize white nationalist language through a media lens that would make them more palatable to the average conservative. This was basically the entire project of people like Rush Limbaugh and, uh, you know, and the whole Fox News project. And it's what Tucker Carlson has basically become the probably most efficient master of in our modern day. But that is a topic for probably another video in this series, not this one. But just know that a lot of militia groups grew up because they were uh, ginned up into anger. Probably there is a lot of racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia baked into this idea. These are right-wing conservative people after all, but uh, not as, this is, this is gonna be like really, really like, you know, razor thin discussions here, but like um, when we're talking about actual far right organizing by people who are non-ironic, not, uh, you know, implicitly racist, but like explicitly through like a whole worldview defined by totalizing hatred, and then people who just have really shitty opinions. <laughs> and if you look into any militia group, what you're going to find is a complex soup of all of that. Uh, sometimes more, sometimes less. And one of the things I learned about a lot of militia groups is that most of the time their inspiration was not this uh, millennialist idea of starting a race war in order to have your day of the rope and kill all the people of color and build this all white homeland. But actually a lot of them were ginned up to action through sort of more second order right wing concerns of the 1990s, specifically like radical anti-gun control beliefs, which were also sort of uh, fertilized and uh, agitated by the NRA. But there was also uh, a, a right wing hist. Turns out that conservatives are very easy to just gin up into hysteria. Also in the 1990s, there was this right wing hysteria about immigration. This is sort of why in an episode of It's Probably Not Aliens, I mentioned that uh, Men in Black might be the most 90s movie ever made because not only Will Smith, very 90s, uh, I, person, I think that makes sense to everybody. It had its own official Men in Black song, which was a very 90s move. Not only that, but it was about UFOs, which were, you know, with the X-Files and everything, a very popular topic in America in the 1990s. And in a way, a lot of the language in Men in Black was about immigration and anxiety about immigration, which is also very 90s. Not only immigration hysteria, but a lot of these militia groups were built up around what I'm just gonna call Weird libertarian shit. <laughs> I feel like people are more familiar today with WLS than they were in the 90s, but you know, your typical mixes of the people who can't go to a lot of meetings anymore because it's too close to a public school. You know, shit like the gold standard and weed and your ability to drink raw milk. You know, libertarians come in a lot of flavors. Usually they have one very specific thing that they are weirdly obsessed with. The militia movement also seems to have a link with the neoliberal turn in American politics as the uh, Clinton administration came into power and there was this whole idea of this like technocratic pro-capitalist control of 
making America a hyper-efficient market society. But what that resulted in, and still is an ongoing process today in America, is a hyper-fixation on urbanizing the United States and focusing economic development in the U.S on the coasts and the cities. It's sort of an acceleration of what's going on in the globe at large, but that does mean that America, a very, very large country, has a huge rural center that is uh, emptying out and decaying. There are several states in the US today that don't have a population density high enough to qualify for statehood if they had to try again. And to this day, a lot of rural areas in America are just being left to crumble with virtually no consideration by uh, the government. This is why it pissed off so many West Virginians when like, for example, Hillary Clinton, when asked, what are you gonna do if you wanna you know, advance a climate change agenda, but uh, what are your plans to do with all of these sort of 50-ish year old coal miners who don't really have uh, another job lined up? And the answer was to teach them to code. <laughs> On that note, a lot of the economies of these rural places is in the field of what's called primary resource extraction, things like mining, logging, that kind of stuff. And so you mix this like abandonment from, you know, the, the, the metropole from, uh, to the periphery with this, uh, with this whole thing, but then also uh, is the rise of various other modern concerns, especially ones that have to do with environmentalism. And what you find is that a lot of people in these sort of exurb slash rural communities, especially on the you know far right, have this almost obsessive anti-environmentalism because they're not particularly concerned with the long-term longevity of the planet or the people on it, uh, but do see the immediate effect of environmental policy being a restriction on their economic prospects with the response of the state being nothing. <laughs> Furthermore, the perfect recipe for conspiracy theories tends to be when your political beliefs become further and further out of tune with the facts of reality. You know, the religious worldview falling apart because of advances in science is sort of the beginnings of things like the uh, Flat Earth Movement. The sort of naturalistic fallacy that shows up in a lot of New Age movements uh, juxtaposed against medical breakthroughs that are, you know, better than any sort of natural thing we could have put together leads to things like the anti-vaccine movement. And so there is a sort of logical throughput of uh, people in sort of socioeconomic situations that creates conspiracy theories and then creates these sort of militant opponents of the government in various fashions. This is not to make excuses for the militia movement, by the way. This is just trying to see things from a sort of economic perspective on how you create uh, a sort of person who would join a militia over uh, various economic concerns they have on board. Keep in mind that there's also a lot of just general bigotry and hatred that is also part of this. And that there are a lot of conservatives, um, not sort of militia people usually, but there are a lot of people in the mainstream conservative movement who uh, try to lean on this sort of, uh, you know, white working class narrative and uh, are not working class in any capacity and use it to try and make excuses for some of the most horrible things of the last decade. Uh, like for example, saying that the white working class is the reason why Donald Trump got elected, which you know verified liberal sort of biases about the poor. But if you look at like the general Donald Trump fan base, it's a lot of sort of petit bourgeoisie, small business owners and stuff like that and are actually richer than the average American. So it doesn't really all pan out that well. Another motivation we see for militia movements and you know, these are all interconnected and some are fueled by other ones, but there's a lot of this attempt to LARP the American Revolution, this sort of strange dialogue with the uh, romantic narrative of the American Revolution as this, uh, you know, people rising up against tyranny and the local advocating over the, the large and centralized. And there are a lot of people in the militia movement who have this belief in uh, trying to build a hyper local society where local politics hold a lot more sway than say national politics. And almost all the time it's about either right wing or sort of bigoted concerns, you know, anti-environmentalism because, you know, the, uh, the EPA is coming in to say that we can't just uh, destroy the local water supply or something like, you know, uh, the civil rights movement. States rights. <laughs> 
and the Civil Rights Act and, you know, the federal government's desegregation um, pissed off a lot of people who have these kinds of beliefs. And a lot of times these hyperlocal people are also motivated by conspiracies and grievances that they heard on right wing radio and have sort of been immersed enough that it makes them angry as well. And then you do have your like, you know, official blood and soil, uh, you know, day of the rope people who are actively wanting to start a race-based American second civil war in order to create a white nation state. And yeah, there's a lot of connections and crossovers in these movements, but it's important to note that the militia movement or patriot movement or whatever you want to call it is an extremely large and very decentralized organization, sort of in the same uh, vein as the thing we talked about in a previous video in this series on uh, leaderless resistance. A lot of times the connection between these groups are small, tenuous, and usually just informal social ties. There's no central militia headquarters or anything like that. And while the belief is that by consuming and believing in the same things that they will uh, achieve the same goals together, that is also a recipe for a lot of divergence and a lot of diversity in the belief structures of the militia movement. All this is to say is that uh, to simply say that the militia was a barely sanitized neo-fascist movement is an oversimplification, I think, I'm going to go with. And it's an oversimplification that causes problems because there are a lot of people who are in the militia movement today that uh, take a lot of resentment to this narrative that's been created by a lot of uh, like a lot of scholars and a lot of journalists who haven't really immersed themselves in the movement and it lets a lot of militia people sort of write off a lot of criticisms from outsiders as uh, people who really don't understand them and uh, just have an ax to grind. And though it's not as untrue as a lot of these militia people believe, there seems to be a lot of denial about the seedier parts of their movement to the point where a lot of militia people did like Pikachu faces when this extremely expected event happened in Oklahoma City with the bombing and led to a lot of people either leaving or doubling down by uh, developing elaborate conspiracy theories that try to explain why the Oklahoma City bombing wasn't done by militia people in order to preserve their already existing worldview. And unfortunately, some of these have uh, metastasized over to the left in weird circles, the two major ones being that uh, Oklahoma City was actually an op by the Japanese for some reason. Even militia people today would say that, that they did not have very good backing for that one. But today you'll see in a lot of sort of conspiracy left, but also in the militia movement, a lot of belief that uh, the Oklahoma City bombing was a conspiracy theory that the FBI did it to themselves in order to justify uh, cracking down on the militia movement. And every time the militia movement gets caught uh, you know, having a shootout with the government or, a, you know, plotting to kidnap the governor of Michigan, you'll find a elaborate conspiracy theory that, uh, no, this was the FBI doing it to themselves because, um, yeah, when reality is inconvenient to your political beliefs, that's the, I'm, I'm, I'm really hammering this home, but that is the, that's the, that, that's the formula to make a conspiracy theory, I think. And by the way, this denial is strong. You can see that there are a lot of militia groups that exist for years and years, seeming as just like, you know, uh, regular right wing guys who sort of live in a rural area and like to uh, LARP the American Revolution and go camping with their guns until you find out that like one of them gets arrested and has like 75 guns in their house and like uh, are building a collection of grenades and landmines preparing for civil war too. And again, every time something like that happens, it becomes a big deal and they get exercised from the movement. But then like all of the militia people who talk constantly about how the federal government is evil and that we need to rise up, do like a Pikachu face being like, oh, we didn't mean that. Look, here comes a consequence, 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 consequences of my actions chasing me right now. I don't want no consequence, consequence, consequence. I don't want no consequences chasing me right now. So it turns out that having hundreds of very local groups where the only unifying thing is uh, common media consumption and common grievances is going to be very complicated. So right after Oklahoma City, there was a major setback. Uh, recruitment into the militia movement started to go down, but then they got their saving grace. 
the U.S. started to become aware and take seriously a threat that programmers had been talking about for decades, the oncoming Y2K problem. And as you'll see, Y2K created this social hysteria and this apocalyptic thinking throughout America that led to a uh, huge increase in militia recruitment. And this is what I want to talk about today because uh, Y2K, as I'll explain, does not seem like something that should make you think the world is going to end, but it really did, and it resonated with Americans in a really big way and led to them moving into the arms of these uh, far-right groups. And this is sort of a cycle that happens a lot in uh, American cultural thinking. So what is Y2K and why did the threat of it resonate so heavily with Americans that it brought it into the arms of the militia movement, especially American conservatives? So Y2K was this uh, computer problem that had been on the horizon for multiple decades. God, the PTA has disbanded! <laughs> but basically the idea was that there were a bunch of computer systems that might have some problems on January 1st, 2000. Long story short, the root of the bug is that in the early days of computers, uh, their space like storage space was at a premium and so in order to save room, a lot of dates specifically would be stored in computer databases only using two numbers because adding the one nine just seemed superfluous. Then there was no thought that maybe the century might end. So what would happen is that the date on a lot of computer programs that were not Y2K compliant would have the year just plugged in as nine nine. And then on January 1st, 2000, the year would switch over to zero zero, and a lot of computers would mistake thinking that that was the year 1900. And that could have been very disruptive on a lot of industries where data management and uh, keeping transactions and things up to date is really important for their day-to-day -day business. Uh, big ones that came to mind are banks, where you know all of their database transactions happen in a digital log with dates on them and also airlines, which use uh, a very complex computer system to essentially manage and coordinate all of the different flights and schedules all together at the same time. And the United States and lots of the world uh, responded by ignoring it for quite a long time until it eventually uh, blew up and turned into a full-on scare like in the last two or three years of the 1990s. To the point where the United States made an entire Y2K task force with a command center and poured billions of dollars into getting America's computer systems Y2K compliant. And then New Year's Day 2000 came and went and despite, you know, a few bugs here and there, like for example, getting the wrong date on like a bus transfer stamp in like an Australian bus system, for example. Uh, for the most part, nothing really happened. <laughs> Some analysts suggest that it was because of the huge amount of money and the Herculean effort that went into making all these computer systems Y2K compliant in a very short amount of time. But there's also a lot of analysts who believe that the entire Y2K scare was overblown and that a lot of it was just drummed up scare tactics in order to sell uh, profits basically for consulting firms that were promising to make different people Y2K compliant. The main evidence they show for this is that there were several countries that made absolutely no efforts to become Y2K compliant and basically nothing happened. But a little thing like this not really being a big deal did nothing to stop the Y2K threat from becoming a massive panic in the United States. And the reason why, tell me if this sounds familiar, is because a lot of them had their hysteria ginned up by the news. Is it interesting to know, this is a curious thing, did you know that 24-hour news networks that have to fill in their 24-hour schedule and keep people's attention by making more and more dramatic stories that play on your fear response got their start when satellite television started becoming a thing in the 1980s? It's weird how political discourse has changed in those specific years. I wonder if there's any connection. The other problem is that the technicalities of the Y2K bug were not really described very well to the American people. So there was just this vague sense that something really bad is gonna happen with computers and that you should be terrified. And it led to some people stocking up lots of food. Not everyone. It is notable that the, uh, the scope of Y2K hysteria has been ginned up and that uh, it was not as many people as you would think who 
you know, bought doomsday bunkers and took survivalist classes because they thought the world was going to end on January 1st, 2000. And in fact, a lot of the people who did have a moral panic were more freaking out and prepping because they thought other people were going to freak out and prep. But there are two very specific and very, you know, overlapping groups of people who were very receptive to this idea of uh, a coming apocalyptic threat. Haywire navigation controls might cause aircrafts to fall from the skies. Electricity grids, water systems, and telephone networks would be knocked out while nuclear power plants would be subject to meltdown. Savings and pension accounts would be wiped out in a general bank failure. A cascade of breakdowns in communication and commerce would create vast shortages of food and medicine, which would, in turn, produce riots, lawlessness, and social collapse. Even worse, ICBMs might rise from their silos, unbidden, spreading death across the globe. And it was two groups that were sort of waiting for the end of the world. The first, it's not too surprising, are the kind of people who would become militia members. Survivalists and preppers, people who think that the apocalypse is always nigh, got this idea that Y2K was going to be a lot worse than they thought and that it was going to lead to essentially a government collapse or that in the wake of the disorder caused by Y2K, the government was going to use that as an excuse to crack down on good old American Joes and take their guns and make them gay marry immigrants or something. And some of the more out there groups like the North Dakota based National Socialist, let me get this right, National Socialist White Revolutionary Party. Uh, actually believed that the chaos caused by Y2K was going to cause the Russians to take advantage of the situation and use that to uh, conquer or, you know, uh, try to do an American takeover and have the sort of Cold War fantasies all happen all over again. Which, if you watched the two videos that I made on post-Soviet Russia, you would know that in 1999, the Russia was in no state to be doing anything of the like. But people in the militia movement, in the whole big scope from your neo-Nazis to racist uncles, did have this idea that someday, or at least we should be prepared for a sort of apocalyptic showdown with the state. And they took it very seriously and got really invested in becoming prepared. Now this could be the big moment. Juxtapose that sort of, uh, you know, growing uh, emphasis on survivalists and, you know, prepping with the news that just got this hot new Y2K story that's talking about uh, how apocalyptic all of these computer glitches are going to be. And you all of a sudden have a lot of people who are ginning up a lot of interest in survivalism, and that would lead them to join their local groups that they thought might have some, you know, survivalist skills to teach them, and resulted in a whole lot of militia recruitment. Or, you know, those movements that have people in them with troubling political beliefs to say the least, just got an influx of a whole lot of new people ready to be radicalized. Probably the biggest one is a group called the Militia of Montana, which actually had its peak membership in 1999, four years after the Oklahoma City bombing. And they capitalized on the Y2K threat by selling seminars and survivalist gear and like, you know, dehydrated food and all that like. So this unique brew of media attention combined with uh, growing emphasis on the survivalist aspects of militia groups led to a lot of public awareness of survivalism, prepping, and, uh, you know, taking them into these social circles. And it wasn't just media figures and journalists. There is a second group, as I mentioned, that also has been waiting for the apocalypse for a very long time. And uh, also have ties and connections to the radical far right. And also have a lot of cross-pollination with these militia groups, evangelical Christians. So in the years leading up to Y2K, a certain number of evangelical and fundamentalist Christians believed that 2000 was going to be the beginning of the end and uh, be the fulfillment of the biblical apocalyptic prophecies of revelations, which uh, in their minds is extremely literal, isn't just a reference to the Roman Empire, and is going to result in like literally like multi-headed beasts and horsemen of the apocalypse literally coming to earth just 
literal fire and brimstone things. And so with the Y2K thread, it just got added to this litany of signs that people were looking out for that the end times were near. And this wasn't just like a niche thing. Very large parts of the evangelical influencer space got involved, including the Reverend Jerry Falwell. Jerry Falwell is a massive influencer in the evangelical space, being motivated to political action when they had to force his segregated Christian academies to integrate racially. Uh, something about that just made him very angry and he got super involved in sort of what's called the religious right. But in this case, uh, he started using the threat of Y2K to convince his following that the end times were near, revelations were on their way, and that Y2K was God sending a sign to humble the nations. So the idea was that this was going to cause the rapture, which um, I'm not, I, I don't really understand religious thinking at all. I really wasn't raised in a religious context, but I guess like is the literal belief that um, all of the good people, all the good Christian people on earth are just going to get like beamed up to the enterprise. Beam me up, God. And then all that's left behind is like all of us evil, non fundamentalist Christians. I think there was like a series of novels written about this, like Left Behind series stuff. I don't know. But Jerry Falwell recommended in the lead up to Y2K that uh, Christians start stocking up on food and guns and start training themselves in survival, which just imagine where that took those people. But yeah, it's based on a apocalyptic thinking in Christianity that there's always this coming end times and that as things are going to get worse, eventually Jesus, like, Jesus, Jesus is going to come back physically and start what's called the thousand year kingdom of God. This would begin with the rapture, which is where all the very good people would just be swept up, i.e. the beaming to the enterprise, as I mentioned earlier. And what that would lead to is a seven year period of rising tumultuous violence and war and chaos symbolized, or I guess in this case, literally uh, perpetrated by four horsemen of the apocalypse riding across the earth and spreading their evil along with them. And then Jesus would return and there would be this final confrontation of good against evil that would then end with the thousand year kingdom of God. This would be the time of the final judgment and basically the end of history. Belief that all this was going to happen uh, in the lead up to 2000 was called premillennialism, while other evangelicals who believe that the path to revelations would happen after 2000 or would begin in 2000 rather than end in 2000 were called post-millennialists. But understanding revelations and this idea of an apocalyptic end times for the world is important for understanding a lot of American culture. It's why, like, for example, some of the most uh, vehement defenders of the, uh, you know, violence of the state of Israel uh, are evangelical Christians because according to their prophecy, uh, there has to be a Jewish government in control of the Temple of Solomon so that they can rebuild the third temple and usher in the end of the world. God damn. The other thing they would look out for, and tell me if this sounds familiar, is that a person or a group would come out of the woodwork and try to start a global world government, a single world order, and that their purpose would be to betray mankind. Uh, basically, these were agents of Satan and were led by an evil figure known as the Antichrist. And what would happen when all of these humongous expectations were met with the non-event of January 1st, 2000? We'll find out after these messages. Hey everybody, I just want to let you know that there is a extended version of this video on Nebula, where I go into an entire section on those who grifted and profiteered off of the Y2K panic. Nebula is a platform that my creator friends and I got together to make where we would be free from the YouTube gatekeepers of algorithmic promotion and demonetization. The stuff we make on Nebula is all ad free. We're able to experiment and try all sorts of new and cool things. Our regular content like this video on Nebula has no ads and has an entire bonus section. These people also got in on cryptocurrencies before crypto was even a thing. And who would be on this platform that would drive you to see their experimental content? Well, I see the analytics. I know who you watch who's not me. And there are a lot of people who I know you like who are also on Nebula and able to do really cool things with this platform. Just a couple off the top of my head. Mia Mulder, NerdSync, Philosophy Tube. H Bomber Guy, FD Signifier, Isaac Arthur, Jacob Geller, the list goes on. And all of this great 
educational content and all these educational creators were so beloved by the people at CuriosityStream that we decided to partner together. And so Nebula and CuriosityStream together have made a deal where you can sign up for CuriosityStream and get Nebula for free. That's free? That's not a trial? As long as you're a member of CuriosityStream, you'd also be a member of Nebula. So you get two streaming platforms with high quality premium educational content for the price of one. In fact, not even for the price of one, CuriosityStream is doing a sale as part of this deal. So you can actually get 26% off an annual membership to CuriosityStream that also gets you a subscription to Nebula. So that's like 74% of the price of one streaming platform for two. That's like, um, that's the, you get, that's like a lot of, of streaming. Nebula is a place for a lot of us small indie creators to make cool content and let us experiment and do crazy things. While CuriosityStream is a platform that makes big budget educational documentaries, which are on par, if not better than anything you would find on Discovery or Animal Planet or something like that. So, you know, imagine CuriosityStream and Nebula just like, hmm. Mm. We're like a we're like a, like a s'mores, like a chocolate and peanut butter of educational streaming services. Speaking of the end of the world, have you ever wondered what it would be like to live through an actual apocalypse? Do you think you'd live? Do you think humanity would live? And if you would survive, what would life be like? Luckily, CuriosityStream has actually made an entire series on this subject called Apocalypse 101. The series is about what it would actually take to survive in an apocalypse situation, and it's being done by an astrobiologist named Louis Dartnell. So yeah, if you sign up to CuriosityStream, use the link in the description or in the top pinned comment, or go to curiositystream.com slash step back. The link works now, by the way. You sign up for a year for $14.79. That's for a year. And once you sign up, you'll get a welcome email from Nebula giving you your code so you can sign up and get your free Nebula membership too. And keep in mind that by supporting CuriosityStream and Nebula, you are helping educational creators on the platform out immensely. You're helping me out personally. Let's just say that having a baby financially is a complicated thing. Just to let you know that by signing up, you're helping myself and many educational creators, as well as just educational content as a whole. It's creating an entire platform and network where we can be focused on getting what is good, what is fulfilling and what is right, rather than kowtowing and uh, forcing reality to conform to what's advertiser friendly or we'll get lots of clicks. So again, link in the description, link in the comments or curiositystream.com slash step back. All right, let's get back to the video. So spoiler alert, January 1st, 2000 came and went and um, the world didn't end. There were a few minor computer glitches that happened, but at the end of the day, nothing major actually uh, went wrong. And as you can imagine, this was a major blow to the militia movement. Reportedly, the Montana militia more or less imploded after Y2K didn't end the world. But for those who left, being wrong was not the end. And this, I think, is important for understanding Y2K and its significance in a more global context. Because there's always a new end of the world to sell people apocalypse gear for. They got into 9-11 conspiracy theories. If you remember, there was a whole lot of grifters selling, like, people in Ohio hazmat suits to protect them from chemical warfare and stuff like that. They'd be back during the financial crisis. And every time there's some sort of threat or uh, some sort of economic uprest, they meant to sell the end of the world because, you know, apocalypse, survival kits. Yeah, I don't have that much money. Where did, where did it go? And here's the thing about America. I think that there will always be another apocalypse. Before Y2K, the apocalypse was the rise of communism or the creation of the United Nations, or it was the creation of the European Union or George Bush with his whole New World Order speech. After 2000, there would be a panic over 9-11, panic over the financial crisis, panic over the Mayan back tune cycle. <laughs> and I'm not alone on this, like media critics who study American culture have shown that the apocalypse features heavily in American cultural products. We're bathed in stories and information about the end of the world. It's a genre in and of itself. And this is old. One of the founders of modern America were pilgrims. 
religious extremists from England who came over trying to prepare their perfect society because they believed if they could make their godly kingdom, that would bring about the end of the world. And even if you don't belong to a religious movement or, you know, even if America is uh, officially a secular society, the cultural impact of evangelical Christianity has its roots all over the place. I was, I'm agnostic and was raised by an agnostic and like a new age psychic kind of person. And yet even I have internalized and bathed in the Protestant Christian culture of Anglo Canada. And so because of this Christian cultural legacy that seeps through every aspect of life, there's this idea that shows up a lot in the American imagination about some end times that's coming up, usually sooner rather than later. And it's not even that far away from discussions about, you know, the rapture and revelations. Very often, there's a lot of stories about an apocalypse being brought about by supernatural forces and very much like salvation of the worthy in face of apocalypse is a large theme that shows up. I mean, look how popular The Walking Dead was. Was? Is it still on the air? I don't know. I think the fact that we think as much as we do about zombies as a concept speaks a lot to this idea. And furthermore, the source of this end times is always brought up by things that we fear, either directly or metaphorically. Zombies, like in the case of The Walking Dead TV show, represent fear of the other. It's immigrants, undesirables, people you don't want in your community. But in various pieces of media and in a lot of the popular conception of how things are going in American culture, apocalypse is always coming, being driven by the government, foreigners. Just something or someone is going to wipe out most of humanity. And only the good and righteous people who understood the wicked ways of the world and prepared accordingly are the ones who survive. And this theme in American culture is constantly going to give ammunition, no pun intended, to reactionary forces. You know, you've got, you know, White supremacists and those who want race war have the Turner Diaries, which is the post-apocalyptic uh, book. Militia folks talk about government overreach and a coming civil war to defeat this overreaching federal government driven by fears of a growing and more centralized state as the U.S. grows and matures into a more modern country. Evangelicals who don't approve of the kind of sex people have or whatever it is that they don't like uh, constantly think about revelations and the end times and how that is going to be a time where all the people they don't like die and the people like them are saved. And I think that Y2K plays into this as well. Y2K played into a lot of Americans' anxiety in a time where society was becoming more and more interconnected, networked, and digitized. And as that happened, the world was becoming more and more complicated in a way that many people could understand less and less. So the idea that the world was becoming this big, untenable connection of these machines that we only kind of understand was a source of anxiety. And the idea that we were so dependent on it meant that one disruption could bring the whole system down. So the thing is, Y2K, if you look at like the actual facts of the case, was never a really great case for any sort of apocalypse. It really only resonated because it became big in a culture of people who, in one way or another, are always kind of waiting and expecting an apocalypse to happen. And they'll just cling to whatever they think works because that's when the people they hate will be punished and then they can rise and have power. And of course, the evil forces often Jews, because almost all conspiracy theories are just anti-Semitism with face paint. And so, yeah, the apocalypse is a big part of American culture because of its evangelical roots. It's also partially responsible for and feeds into the culture of hate and reactionary politics. Because in many cases in American history, when you're talking about proper Christians or those worthy of salvation, it almost always just means white people. And we'll see this imagery come full circle in the next video in this series when we talk about America's reaction to 9-11 and the crackdown or anger or hatred towards Muslims. So make sure to subscribe to Setback so you can watch that video as soon as it comes out. And in the meantime, there's a whole white power movement playlist that this is part of. And if you haven't seen all of them yet, then what's wrong with you? Go and do it.